Hi, well, welcome everyone. Uh, come on in. Let's we can fill this great auditorium. I guess I'm not sure. This feels uh, very COP 26 in here. This is great. Come on in. We'll fill the uh, the rings here, and we'll get started with our our program. Welcome. So we're really grateful to American Institute of Architects for hosting us in their headquarters. Uh, this is my first time being here, but uh, just coming here today it made me smile because I thought this was going to be my life path to be an architect. In fact, I was very deep into that and architecture school and everything. So to be here at AIA headquarters feels like one of those come full circle moments. Uh, so grateful for the opportunity to have this space to to discuss the important topics before us today on mobility and transportation. Uh, yeah. Please come on over. We're going to have, we've got plenty of seats in the center here too. Uh, we'll be at the breakout room tables after we get through our speaker challenge. So we've got this lower row as well. All right. Devesh, thank you for starting the, the inner circle there. Just takes one and then, oh, there we go. And that gets over there too. Perfect. Uh, so my name is H.G. Chazelle. I want to welcome you here. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Advanced Energy Group. It's an organization that I started over five years ago, really to a visceral, visceral response to mayors pledging to stay in when we were stepping out of the Paris Climate Accord. And at that time, Rahm Emanuel penned a letter saying that Chicago is going to stay in and we're gonna find a way to get on a path of decarbonization. And pretty soon I started seeing promises and pledges made by mayors across the country. Washington, DC, Washington, DC took an early lead and boldly on pledges on decarbonization, New York City, Boston. And as the pledges and promises mounted, I started feeling more uncomfortable because I know how hard it is to make any promise happen, much less one that affects the lives of millions of people and is affecting cities, which are systems upon systems, to actually deliver these results in 20, 25 years seemed truly impossible unless we had a complete shift in the way we approached collaboration and that we could truly get out of our silos and start playing to win at what matters most. And that inspired me to think about well, what would stakeholder mobilization look like that could actually make this happen. You know, there is the concept of stakeholder engagement. I'm sure you've seen it in proposals, et cetera. But I, what I've learned is a stakeholder is by nature passive, not engaged. We call them a stakeholder, but they are in the far back row, not on the field on the issues. And how as leaders do we close this gap on promises made and promises delivered? A huge part of that is gonna be our ability to enroll leaders to get on the field and focus on winning at what matters most. And that was really the inspiration for these quarterly stakeholder challenges to find a venue for you as leaders to come to the table, not with solutions, but with true problems and obstacles to solving those problems that you can't do alone. Because in truth, systemic change just will not happen without extraordinary collaboration. And that comes from leaders like yourselves enrolling people in solving for problems. So today, our format will be our invited speakers are going to present to you what they feel is a critical obstacle regarding mobility and transportation. In order for Washington, D.C. to achieve its clean energy and equity goals that must be collaboratively overcome. And you're going to vote on which one of these obstacles presented to you that you feel we should all stop what we're doing and focus on solving. So at a point after you hear from each of our speakers, you are going to have the floor essentially with your vote to help determine which of these obstacles presented 
requires collaboration, needs to be solved now, and it's something that you want us to focus on doing something about. After we've established that obstacle, we're going to go to the breakout room section here where you'll be at tables where you'll have 45 minutes to work together to come up and propose a 12-month solution with quarterly milestones that could, success us, could successfully overcome that obstacle. And you are going to vote on which table has the most viable and impactful proposed 12-month solution. At that point, I'm going to ask you whether or not you'd be willing to volunteer to be on a task force to actually deliver that 12-month solution. How many of you in the room are currently on an AEG task force or have volunteered in the past to be on one? All right, so you are volunteering, you're getting on these task forces. How many of you have accomplished milestones as part of these task forces? Right? Yeah, Zach, I know several of you had. Cheryl uh, Uday and DC Water Team definitely has achieved nearly every quarterly milestone. So that's our process. That's how we get to stakeholder mobilization. And so today I'm really excited to kick things off um, with opening remarks. And I have Andrew Smith to come and provide opening remarks from WSP. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything here in terms of what we want to cover at the beginning here. Uh, we've been so lucky in the past to have our events at Holland and Knight, which has provided us a great venue, which I've been very familiar with in terms of the setup and everything. So we're getting in our new space here today. So we get to have this experience here, and then we get to go to the breakout rooms. Uh, when we do the voting, I just want to cover this logistic point, you're going to use Slido. And Slido, you can see the QR code there on the screen. You can use it on your phone, or you can just go to slido.com and the code is DC21Q4. That'll be where you'll put your vote in for that obstacle you feel we need to most focus on. I want to thank our sponsors who believe in this approach to stakeholder mobilization, who have helped us grow. We are now supported by nearly 60 public and private organizations across four cities, Chicago, New York, Boston, and Washington, DC. We're active now annually in the Caribbean. There is the Caribbean Island Resilience Action Task Force, which is successfully completing their 12-month solution to provide islands a scorecard to measure resilience and vulnerability that's being presented at COP uh, because of its success, which is very exciting to see happen. So I want to just acknowledge all those sponsors who have helped make this grow. I'm going to next turn it over here to Andrew Smith. He is the Senior Vice President for WSP. Uh, he has a broad knowledge on these issues, and he is going to start us off with our program today. Andrew, welcome. All right, Andrew. So we have some microphone thing. Yeah, we're going to get you lined up here. This one will go here. And I'll turn this on, and this can just go in your pocket. Okay, awesome. And this one. Thank you very much and good morning. There we go. We need a little bit of energy in the room. So 29, 3, 43. What do these numbers mean? 29% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States can be attributed to the transportation sector. Only 3% of the current bus fleet is zero emission. And 43, 43 Empire State Buildings, the power required to have a completely electrified New York City bus fleet. The US Transportation Network provides mobility to, uh, of people and goods. However, the US transportation sector always um, relies heavily on fossil fuels to power cars, trucks, and buses, thereby creating significant problems, including greenhouse gas emissions. So while the transportation industry remains focused on maintaining and improving mobility, we have an opportunity 
to positively impact climate change, public health, energy independence through electrification and clean energy solutions. Good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Smith. I am the regional development director for WSP's southeastern region. Um, and in this role, I really have three responsibilities. First, I ensure that our clients have access to all of our uh, experts across each of WSP's eight business lines. Second, I champion a growth mindset within our organization. And finally, I serve as a strategist for our clients on some of their largest, mo most complex problems that they're facing. It has been proven that the humans are the most adaptable species on the planet. Our capacity to adjust to change is why the human species has survived and others have not. Humans have a great track record of reacting to what is within sight and what we believe to be with sufficient certainty. We adapt to the upside and the downsides. We seek to minimize uncertainty. We generally don't adapt to live larger. Today's challenge is adapting to climate change by making what appears to be predictable, controllable, incremental moves after the fact is no longer good enough. If we think about mobility, there hasn't been a significant shift, paradigm shift in, in the way that we move since the invention of the automobile over 100 years ago. I guess maybe, maybe we don't ride horses anymore. Maybe we retired the horse but other than that, we're, we're pretty much where we are. Furthermore, we haven't significantly changed the way that we prioritize, fund, transportation investments over the last 30 years. So in a marketplace where speed and unpredictability are becoming constant, we need to anticipate where we can be prepared to adapt and capitalize when the inevitable, unanticipated happens. Absent a known future, it's hard for people to anticipate. Without confidence in positive outcome, why bother tackling the unexplained? Today, we take a lot of pride um, about approaching the world analytically. When faced with a confusing event, we search for cause and effect. If we, can't deter if we can determine how one action follows another action, um, it helps us explain it, explain why it happened and when it might reoccur in the future. This makes the outcomes reliable. The project development and delivery process guiding transportation investments at the state and local level is detailed, prescriptive, even collaborative. However, these standard pra practices are perfectly designed to produce the transportation infrastructure that we have today. So does the current way we develop transportation investments limit our desire to take on the unexplained or the unknown, thereby limiting our ability to see new possibilities and a future different from today? When logic fails, stories and superstition prevail. Although I was very superstitious the last week as my Atlanta Braves were able to win the World Series, which was exciting. I was doing a lot of superstitious things and it apparently worked out. But really when logic fails, leadership and courage is required. So the industry has clearly articulated the planning and implementation requirements needed to transition to zero, energy, zero emissions transport. We understand the energy requirements the workforce development needs, fleet transitions, supporting infrastructure requirements, but how are these elements planned, funded, and prioritized within the context of all of our transportation investments? Is the regulatory environment supporting, hurting, neutral on the evolution to a clean energy transportation future? Regardless, it's entrepreneurial leaders like you that will realize our clean energy future. To do something unbelievable is difficult and will require planning, focus, discipline, and commitment. 
To be the leaders that do something unbelievable, I submit there's really five core elements that we need to think about. Number one, have clarity of mission. We need to articulate specifically the goals and outcomes we want to achieve. Develop a plan, work the plan. Have a playbook of what needs to happen and when and the parties responsible. Zero distractions and zero excuses. It's easy to get wrapped up in the urgencies of today. Welcome a diversity of thought. This is absolutely a team sport. And then number five is to review, learn, adapt, revise, reload. The road to unbelievable is, is certainly not straight, smooth, maybe not even paved. So be prepared to learn from the journey, incorporate lessons, and adapt to changing conditions. So what if we can? What if we can align policies and politics? What if we can accelerate electrification through revised regulation? What if our regulatory framework can be adaptable and flexible to the unexpected? What if we can? Let's get to work. You need all the kit back now. There you go. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Andrew, for that opening. And now we'll be able to start our speaker challenge with our first speaker, Eric Campbell, State Energy Program Manager with the Department of Energy and Environment. He has been focused on developing a path, a plan forward for clean transportation in the region. And I'm very grateful that you're going to kick things off for us this morning. Welcome. We got some miking up. I'll move this one for you. This one goes here. Hey. And we got one more. Okay. Can I do this? Thank you. Uh, just checking. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Uh, first of all, congratulations to the Atlanta Braves. Um, I would like to give them most credit for absolutely trouncing my Baltimore Orioles when I got to see them play earlier this year. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Campbell. I'm from the Department of Energy and Environment. Um, I would like to say uh, my title's a little slightly outdated. Uh, the, just a program analyst now. But the, my mission remains the same of dedicating myself towards the transportation space and sort of guiding to how the district can meet its carbon emission goals um, by 2050 to become a carbon neutral city. Uh, I have exactly eight minutes, which I'm starting my timer now, to make sure that I give you, guys, give you all a broad outlook of, why, of the challenge that we see fit and how we can utilize your help figuring this out. So um, you already know I'm from the District of Columbia, so I think we can skip past this slide here and move on to what I've been working on. For the past couple of years, I've been working on what's known as the Transportation Electrification Roadmap, which, is set out, um, which, which was set out and developed by the Clean Energy DC Act, which behooves the district to find its, um, uh, its goals that are listed out here, I'll go through each of them individually. But to, in order, uh, this was all built upon the Clean Energy DC plan, which let out our general understanding of how can we meet our overall um, transportation goal uh, by 2050 in the access to lowering carbon emissions to become a carbon neutral city. Now the act um, had two pieces to it, it had the Clean Vehicle Transition Plan and the uh, Transportation Electrification Program. What we decided to do is combine the both of them into a transportation electrification roadmap based on what we've seen other cities do. And overall, the roadmap has three different goals, as you can listen here. But for fun, let me go over them as well. The first is that uh, by 2030 and scaling up to 2045, we want all buses, private fleets, which includes taxi cabs, limousine services, anything that's transporting people from uh, one place to another to be 50% low or zero emission by 2030 and scaling up every five years to 100% zero emission vehicles by 2045. Goal number two, uh, that by the end of uh, 2021, that we'll have a policy set in place for 100% EV replacement for all public buses 
in school buses at the end of their useful life. Thankfully, the, um, when, I, when I mentioned this to some of those folks, they freaked out a little bit, but I said this is the policy going forward. Um, we, at the, uh, the roadmap overall, looked at to see and how uh, we can develop a fleet transition plan for some of the, uh, the fleets that have been established already. Uh, DDOT has been leading the charge with one of the largest pilot programs on the East Coast, and I give them a huge amount of credit for suffering a lot that we can learn, uh, we can learn from them. And then finally, uh, goal number three is that uh, by 2030, we want at least 25% of zero emission vehicles registered in the district um, which, if you were to take an estimate of around 300,000 vehicles that are registered in the district, this would give us an estimate of around 75,000 EVs to be registered in the district. Overall, we want the roadmap to provide these cost estimates, timelines, and anything in between that would help guide the district through these actions. And what I'm going to be asking from you all is a very unique challenge that the district has. Um, what, um, while I do say the most unique challenge that I'm presenting to you is actually a challenge that I have, is although we have finished writing the plan, uh, it is not yet publicly consumable at this time. So what I'm only able to talk about this time is anything that I have been uh, talked about is our stakeholder engagement sessions, which we've held around eight or nine over the past year. Uh, so some of the information is already publicly available, but more information is going to become available as the plan officially becomes published, hopefully in the next three to four months. Uh, but so with one hand tied behind my back, let's move on. One of the largest things is looking at that uh, goal number three of the 25% uh, of registration of EVs in the district. Now, uh, I think most of the people here, and I assume most of the people in the district have some sort of uh, final degree, and so I know we're all really good at squinting at grass. But to give you a picture of what this overall means is we have in this ecosystem that we have developed, we have a need for both the infrastructure and the right type of incentive for vehicles to be purchased at the same time. One of the largest problems and things I hear in the EV space is like, well, what is it? Is it a chicken or egg, or egg scenario? And I'm very glad my grantees aren't here because they heard me tell this joke so many times is I'd rather approach this as making a chicken omelet in this case, where we want to have the right type of incentive for both the infrastructure as well as the uh, incentive for vehicle um, purchases as well. What we see here is that, um, uh, as I lay out, and I can go into more specifics of the numbers over time, that we need to have both the amount of public infrastructure to be available for the drivers as well, uh, in order to match the amount of electric vehicles that we want to have registered in the district. In the roadmap in its entirety, we, we scheduled this out, oh, sorry, we scaled this up between a, um, a low, medium, and high scenario, with the low being the blue and the high being the gray, with the medium being the Goldilocks in between the two. Now, we realize that although the, technically the amount of infrastructure that we have developed within the district can meet the current needs of it, it's not also taken in fact that we have roughly, uh, as the city sort of breathes, so does the amount of folks who are uh, um, commute district, which adds around, around in some cases between three to 500,000 individuals coming in. This was obviously pre-COVID time. And so trying to have the right necessary amount of public charging as well as workplace charging available for all these different uh, vehicles that are coming into the district presents a big challenge. But specifically what we're looking at is how do we help the district residents to transition over to more electric vehicles? One of the largest challenges that we do see in the space is that we actually don't have any um, dealership located in the district besides the Tesla uh, dealership or the trade um, that you can uh, find over on K Street in case you're interested of doing something after this meeting. But the challenge is, it's like, how do we provide this? Where Maryland incentives exist for Maryland drivers and, and uh, residents of Virginia incentives exist for Virginia drivers and residents, but nothing really for the district. Realize is, is as part of the roadmap, we developed what we call Navy ecosystem here as part of our uh, DC um, adoption campaign. Now, um, we originally designed this if we see that this is for the plus of the problem. We realized that we need to try to combine as much of the different resources and network opportunities that we have available that we can see to find some sort of challenge of how do you uh, try to prioritize the right types of both infrastructure build and transportation incentive that can exist from all, the, uh, all different sides. Now, I call this a kind of design as sort of the peacock method, is where all these different aspects going from your retailers up to your charging station manufacturers to the government all play within design of the EV ecosystem. Or if I look at it, just thinking of the peacocks in the middle and all the different feathers are spread out from there. What I see, the unique challenge where we can use a lot of help um, uh, 
meeting is that you know, within the district we have so many resources available and we would love to be able to branch this to, um, to help our district resident, but a lot of it requires uh, sometimes of allocating the right type of resources that exist outside the district to bring them in. And the challenge is, is, is being able to connect or network with all these different types of uh, organizations that exist that can help bring the CV ecosystem together. So my overarching or can challenge is saying like, what, what are some of the right ways that we can help uh, meet these needs of bringing each of these uh, aspects uh, together? Now this exists not only just for the light duty vehicles, but it can also exist for heavy duty vehicles and medium uh, duty vehicles as well. I'm talking to expand the bridge over to school buses, or larger transit buses, or even um, outside of the scope of what the roadmap develops, looking at your refuse trucks, your construction vehicles, so on and so forth. All this like plays huge amounts of dividends in terms of benefits for the district resident. Realizing that I am now getting close to my time, let me get to the main cost and reasons why I would like to do this. So we all know keeping an ear on, ear on the ground, or at least I'm a little hard of hearing, so both of them, and I use my eyes a lot, um, we see that some of the benefits that this is a one time to strike while the iron's hot. We realize that there is a lot of momentum, both political will and interest, as well as some of the first time that we started to see an educated response from most, uh, from most uh, consumers about what does an EV mean, outside of being able to name just one or two. The overall benefit is, that we see is to creating an accessible network of resources for the district residents. Um, you know, throughout the district that combines everything that, um, being able to say, hey, um, if you are interested in buying an EV, we can, here are some of the resources that you can bring available to a dealership and also providing the same type of res uh, resources at the dealership to help sell the EVs better for district residents. To combine them with both the resources and some of the incentives that we have planned in order for all this, uh, we have planned to release as part of this roadmap. But most importantly, we want to make sure that this is uh, centered around the need for equitable placement within the district. This is both from the charging station uh, assets, uh, making as much public charging available, as well as trying to centerize the needs of what does a uh, folks who live in underserved communities, what can help incentivize them to ditch, uh, to ditch a vehicle and try to um, move on to an electric option. One of the things that we found from our stakeholder engagement campaign is tax incentives aren't as effective as you think they would be, especially for folks. And realizing some of the ways that we can decrease the, the initial capital, or the sticker price or the capital cost of transitioning to an EV and trying to find different methods for either uh, programs to assess them, whether they are grant programs or anything that lowers the initial value of the EV right, right up front. We realize that by utilizing some of those types of uh, incentives or levers, knobs, or boffets that you, that you can think of helps, um, we, we learned that helps drive that, um, that mission forward. Now, um, uh, the cost of what this is, and uh, sometimes they consider this as the cost or sometimes consider it as the price, is um, this, if the op loss of opportunity of not doing something like this. For the one is the amount of federal and district resources that are becoming available. In the first case, we know that um, Everyone here, I'm assuming, is like has uh, um, seen emails or know the words of the new uh, spending opportunities that are coming forward for both the infrastructure as well as some of the uh, additional grantee option. And a lot of that money is being able to be poured into the district as well as other areas. Uh, DOE as well as the D, uh, as well as US DOT has released a large amount of fund to make available to help this transition as much as possible. Um, and not being able to strike now or to be able to put these resources in, in a place to help our, uh, our residents in the district from an equitable standpoint would be a huge loss of opportunity for them, which would only make it more expensive going forward. And the second one is the air quality impact for our underserved communities. The district has one of the highest asthma rates where as one in five adults who lived in some of the uh, um, wards five, seven, and eight are suffering from some sort of asthma. Now, while there's no direct connect, uh, connection that's been established that's saying that air pollution causes asthma, we do know that it does cause asthma attacks to happen. And trying to find ways that we can improve the air quality uh, in the district specifically for those who live around areas with, uh, high, high, with um, excuse me, highways or near, near depots, we realize that the opportunity to electrify these options would play beyond the impacts of carbon emission reduction, but the air quality emission benefits that we would get from there would be a huge service to the communities that we can do. So as uh, I was instructed, we wanna end this uh, presentation on the sentence of regarding mobility and transportation to achieve the Washington DC 2050 carbon equity goal, 
A critical obstacle that the district government um, realizes to overcome is the equitable access of resources to enable electrification adoption for low, medium, uh, lead, medium, and heavy duty vehicles across the district. What I would add is to make sure that this is also equitably done to be focused in the wards that can benefit the most from the, the electrification option. So my, my plea to you is that if you would like, if you choose to join me with one hand tied behind my back, it's until about six months from now when we do, when we are able to release the, uh, excuse me, three to four months from now when we are able to release the uh, roadmap, uh, my plea is to help create this sort of DC adoption, uh, consumer adoption campaign and to really be able to leverage all the resources that we already know exist, but to be able to connect all of them together to help uh, our, both our district residents and our district community uh, with our partners over in Maryland, Virginia, together to help make an ele more electric future option available. I went slightly over time, but I appreciate everyone's interest as well. Um, if you do vote for me, um, you will make this Hufflepuff really proud, but either way, I would love to have any questions. Regardless if we do decide to be, if, I, if you do decide to join this campaign or not, I would love to have as much interest as possible when this um, roadmap does finally get delivered. If it's something that you might not be interested in now, but later on where you feel like there was a great way to leverage some of the resources that we want to have available, I would love to be able to re-engage you at that point as well. Thank you very much for your time and best of luck to my fellow competitors out there. You're going to need it, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much.